Okay, kia ora koutou. Welcome everyone to this learning series event. Today I've got with me James Cochran uh, and Andrew Comer. They're from Lane Neve. Uh, Lane Neve is um, a very well-known kind of full gamut law firm specialising in, in business and personal law, but their specialty is making really complex stuff simple. So welcome guys. Uh, if you want to do you. some introductions, then uh, we'll kick things off. Thanks. Thanks, David. Hi, everyone. I'm James. I'm one of the Dispute Resolution and Web3 Digital Assets Partners based in our Auckland office. Andy? Hi, guys. I'm a, a corporate partner here in the Auckland office, sit, uh, alongside James, also a, a Web3 partner as well, and have followed James down the, the Web3 blockchain rabbit hole, and here we are today. So looking forward to some sharing some insights with you guys. Yeah, I'm on the Executive Council for Blockchain NZ. Uh, we, I'm also part of the Legal Working Group for Blockchain NZ. As a, a firm, our Web3 Digital Assets team services a, a whole range of digital assets clients from private clients through to, to businesses. And I guess we advise on both contentious and non-contentious advisory type work. We've done a number of, well, acted for, for a number of clients and given advice in, in relation to a number of different types of crypto business, including NFTs, and I've done a number of presentations to various organizations on NFTs as well. So hopefully we will make the complex simple for you today, and but bear with us. It's the first time using Circle, and we're having some technical difficulties getting our, our slides working. So hopefully you can see us moving through our slides. If it all turns pear-shaped, we'll, we're happy to send you a copy of the slides if you want to get in touch with David. That's um, one, James. I'll, I'll just go into the format briefly. So um, they're going to go through the presentation and uh, feel free to put any questions you have in the chat as we go. And at the end, we'll have uh, a Q&A and &A and um, I'll have a few questions for you guys as well. So when you're ready. So this just gives you a, a bit of a high-level overview of what we, we're going to be discussing today um, and what the legal landscape looks like. So hopefully you come away with um, a bit of an appreciation um, that there are actually a lot of legal issues to consider. In terms of um, practical guidance, uh, we're going to set out for you what, what the law requires of you at a, at a fairly high level. Um, it should be able to give you a bit of a roadmap um, for you to think about when, when you're doing a Web3 project? Uh, I guess we, we, we should note that while we're going to cover a number of different acts today, we're not going to be covering, and we can't cover just in the, given the, the time involved, all the acts that could apply. We, we're New Zealand lawyers. We also can't give advice on any other type of uh, law, any foreign law, any other type of professional advice like um, accounting advice, uh, financial advice. So um, uh, we're, we're, we're limited in terms of what we can talk about. And in any case, we're not giving any specific legal advice today. If you have an NFT project or another um, digital assets project, you'll need to seek specific advice to be able to rely on that. This is for educational purposes to cover off, I guess, as Andy said, give you a roadmap as to the sort of things that we uh, need to give consideration to when we're advising you and also the sort of things that the regulators will want when and if you come into contact with them. Yeah, so here's a, a quick overview of um, the topics that we are going to be covering today. We don't need to read them out. The first half, as you can see, is the focus is on compliance and, and the second half uh, is looking at uh, legal issues more broadly. So this, this flow chart gives you a high level overview of um, the typical approach that we take um, when uh, a Web3 project comes across our desks, um, gives you a bit of an insight as to um, how we service our clients and how we operate. Um, yeah, I guess I, as a, um, a litigator, that's been my bread and butter for most of my career. I guess I look at things with a lens as to 
I guess how a, how a regulator might look at a project, and Andy has been more on the advisory side as thinking about well how do we shape the documents and 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 look at the asset and look at the structuring that's involved to best about achieving the outcome that you want. Yeah, and and sitting above it all is the key issue around risk. That's what we are trained to do: is to identify and and mitigate risk as as far as we can. And so just quickly looking at that, the, the flow chart. So once the onboarding process is done, that's when our real work tends to, to kick off. But it's incumbent on you guys to come to us with a, a clear idea as, as to what it is you hope to achieve. And you need to be clear on the key commercial elements of your project. And you need to communicate your pressure points to us around timing, cost, and any key areas of, of concern. And so once we've we've given you advice, you know, you'll go away, consider what we've told you, you'll consider the next steps, you obviously have some questions, and then that's an opportunity to bottom out any issues. And it's typically at that stage that we, we start to look at putting structures in place that will best protect you for your Web3 project. And if, if we think there are any regulatory issues that are coming into play, yeah, we'll, we'll definitely look to to get in touch with the regulators at that stage. Yeah, I guess one thing that may that will certainly assist us may make your fees with us more palatable for you is if you give us a really good breakdown of what the project is and how it works from sort of start to finish. You know, the things we'll be looking for and sort of in particular around maybe exchange, you know, is is this going to be just really what is in effect a, a, a sale of a good, you know, just a, a mint for, a, well, a, a sale of the NFT or is, or is there more complexity involved, you know, things like a, is there any sort of burn mechanism, is there a physical asset involved? Is there some sort of treasury? Are you looking at a DAO? That sort of thing. Those are the going to be the sort of key considerations in terms of the regulations. So now we'll move on to the compliance legislation. And the key one being the Financial Markets Conduct Act or the FMCA. So this is New Zealand's key piece of securities law. It replaced the old Securities Act about 10 years ago. And it came in as a bit of a response to the, the tidal wave of finance company collapses. And its, its primary driver is to ensure that retail investors have all the adequate information uh, they need in order to be able to invest uh, in, a, in a product. It also puts the asset on uh, offers as well to ensure that they're giving enough uh, information to those investors. So, so to give you a bit more context, generally, if someone is making an offer to the public that is is going to be well could be dealt with by our financial markets conduct act most of you will probably be familiar with the action that the uh, sec and gary gensler uh, are taking against various crypto uh, projects around the world you might be familiar with the case against ripple labs and the action being taken against Coinbase and Binance. Um, and also I think um, Richard Hart is sort of the, the latest one. And, and the allegation generally is that there has been a offer of, of securities without a disclosure statement. So in New Zealand, if you have, if you are making an offer of financial products, generally that needs to be accompanied by a product disclosure statement, also called a PDS. The if the consequences if you make an offer of financial products that isn't compliant are pretty serious. So you've got potential criminal liability. So the so if if it's a company that makes the offer, it can be the company that can be liable. It can also be the director can also be personally liable. Maximum penalties, 10 years in prison, $1 million fine um, for an individual or $5 million for a company. So the liability consequences incredibly serious. 
There's also uh, civil liability as well, isn't yep. there? Okay. So you can be pinged for three times the amount of many gains that you may have uh, earned from your project. So it's, there's some pretty serious implications of getting it wrong. Yeah, so the, uh, I guess also the FMA, which is the Financial Markets Authority, also has other powers which could affect a project, right? So they could include stop orders, which pre prohibit further action in respect of the, I guess, the NFT mint. They may, may make direction orders or they could issue infringement notices. So this could essentially s stop a NFT project sort of in its tracks. Yep. So what, what that might mean is, you know, for example, if the project had been launched and, you know, if you had it on a marketplace, probably in New Zealand, a marketplace like Glorious, for example, then Glorious would be probably inclined to take it down. And I guess that could affect the value of the project. So if we're presented with an, an NFT project, which we think could have FMCA implications, we'll typically try and run an analysis under the FMCA to see whether or not your project comes within any of the four categories of financial product. So you can see them on the screen now and we can yeah, quickly canter through them. The upshot is if, if you're offering a financial product, you are an issuer under the FMCA. And James has just talked about the implications of that and we'll, we'll canvas that a little bit later on. Uh, equity securities, they're the most commonly um, understood form of security. Um, um, critically, there's no right to repayment if, you're, uh, if you've been issued an equity security as opposed to a debt security, which sets it apart. Um, there is a, a right to repayment. Um, examples are you know, corporate bonds, convertible notes, government bonds, etc. Derivatives, yeah, we've talked about on the screen there, futures contracts, options. Um, these are um, contractual arrangements where um, you have to give some form of consideration to a third party at some point in the future. And that consideration is driven off something else. For example, uh, an underlying asset, an index or a commodity. And we've had to run this analysis on an NFT project that we've both been involved in, whereby a, a token was issued and that was stapled to a real world asset. And we had to run an, anal an analysis to determine whether or not that fit within that, that category of financial product. The, the fourth one there is managed investment products. So this is you know, what you probably commonly understand to be things like KiwiSaver and property syndicates. It's an interest in a, in a managed investment scheme whereby the purpose is to pull funds so you can derive interests in the scheme. You're not allowed to have any day-to-day -day say in the operating, op sorry, operation of the scheme. And the interests or the financial benefits are usually produced by the activities or efforts of someone else. And then, and then finally, the designation power is, is you know, what one that is wholly important. And by this, the, the FMA has the power to actually designate a specific security as being a financial product. And so what they'll do is they'll look at the substance of what's being offered rather than how it's been described or the form. And, and so they can say, right, that is a financial product. It does come under the FMCA. Yeah, so that's so that is quite critical. So the definition of security under the Act means an arrangement or a facility that has or is intended to have the effect of a person making an investment or managing a financial risk. So it's very broad in terms of like the Ripple Labs case, the so key issue there is whether the whether the parties that were buying the XRP were making their parties to an investment contract. So the the wording is, I guess, similar to the test that they use in, in the US called the Howey test. So I guess the, con the consequences of this is that if, if the FMA was to consider that the, pro the project was a security, 
they do have this power. I mean, there's a lot of steps that they have to go through in order to designate something a security, but it's a risk, I guess, to be aware of in any case. And, and what it stresses again is the importance of getting legal advice early on in your project. So we've probably talked to a number of points on this, this slide. The, the length of the PDS is often determined by the nature of the financial product that's being offered. There are a number of obligations that come with offering a financial product other than disclosure. So there are certain fair dealing, governance, operations-based obligations that are put on you. I should also mention that there are a number of exceptions and exclusions under the FMCA, which would uh, excuse you from having to prepare a product disclosure statement. And, and there are a whole raft of them in the Act. Um, most common ones include if you're offering to uh, wholesale investors, so experienced investors, investors with uh, certain thresholds of um, assets or revenues, um, if you're offering to close business associates, et cetera. Yeah, I think it's, a, it's safe to assume if you are doing a mint of NFTs that there is a reasonable risk that you could be offering the NFTs to New Zealand retail public. And the trigger point is, if you are offering to only one retail investor out of uh, the pool of investors, the FMCA will apply. Uh, yeah, so I guess what we're, we're doing when we go through the project, when we get the facts from you, we doing an analysis, does it fall within one of these categories of financial product? There's in our experience, you know, reasonable arguments why a lot of NFTs don't fall within the definition, you know, the, the, the classic four uh, categories of financial product. But you should be aware that we have to do this analysis so that when you or we go to the FMA, if that's what you elect to do, we need to be able to explain how it all works and why, for example, it, it might fall into one of the categories or why it doesn't, why it isn't a uh, financial product. And so you're not subject to the requirements of the act. So financial service providers. So we've got um, legislation in New Zealand that captures providers of financial services and there are certain obligations that apply to them. So if you're providing a financial service in New Zealand, you have to be registered on the financial service providers register. Offering a financial service or financial service itself is defined pretty broadly in, in the law. Uh, it captures anything from someone operating a, a money, or money or value transfer service. If you're offering a financial product or if you're offering a financial market or product market, sorry. Uh, it also captures virtual asset service providers as well. So those people that are offering a virtual asset exchange people that are providing storage for virtual assets or anyone who's brokering virtual asset transactions. And, and the other point is if, if you are found to be a financial service provider, you also have to join a dispute resolution team. So there's um, a, a way in which um, disgruntled investors have the ability to, uh, to claim against you. I guess one of the key points is you'll need to register as a financial service provider if you an anti-money laundering reporting entity under our anti-money laundering legislation for providing financial services. And the test there is reasonably broad and most VASPs will be caught under the definition of financial institution under the AML CFT Act 2009. So there's just a couple of points to be made here regarding jurisdiction. If you're extending the offer or allowing participants in New Zealand only, you're limiting the scope of regulation to New Zealand law. So this, this sort of allows you to plan and, and budget accordingly to ensure that you're complying with New Zealand laws. It also means you, you, you're only having to deal with one regulator. If conversely you're, you're allowing participation outside New Zealand, you're basically uh, 
opening up Pandora's box. You know, for example, you know, most countries uh, have similar securities laws to New Zealand. And, and so if you're offering beyond our borders, this means you're going to have to comply with uh, the securities laws in those jurisdictions as well. And, and some of those laws might in practice actually be you know, more strict than, than what we've got in New Zealand. So that's why we strongly recommend Web3 project creators to, to seriously consider the scope of participants from a jurisdictional perspective. Uh, finally on that list, there are certain countries around the world that have been uh, blacklisted by the Financial Action Task Force. That's the, the Global Anti-Money Laundering Watchdog. And if you're blacklisted, that means that um, your AML laws aren't up to a certain level, which creates risk for anyone dealing with with uh, entities within those countries. The, the blacklisted countries at the moment are North Korea, Iran, and Myanmar. And so if you're offering, if you're creating a project, consider excluding them from the offer. You also probably want to have a think about other countries that uh, you know, may have human rights abuses, there may be uh, corruption, unfriendly governments, or there might be war sympathizers. And so we typically would recommend that our clients exclude those countries as well from, uh, from the project. And I guess one, um, there's a couple of ways that you can attempt to control this. And I guess that's through your website, terms and conditions, your, you know, their T's and C's associated with, for example, your Telegram or your Discord. And also, I guess, if you are going to mint through a third-party exchange, typically third-party exchanges will uh, have some sort of know your client AML, CFT requirements because they will, exchanges are typically VASPs, so they will hopefully have done some screening for those excluded nations. Fair dealing. Yep, so fair dealing is caught under the Financial Markets Conduct Act, but also under our Fair Trading Act. And this is essentially a consumer protection law, which is designed to protect market participants from misleading deceptive statements. For example, um, I guess if, if you are making statements or having the developers making statements in the for example, the, the Discord chat, um, try to ensure that those are, aren't are misleading. You know, they're not overblown about what you are promising to deliver. Mm -hmm. um, can be su supported by facts. There was a, a case, we've done an article about it, which you can find online if you want to have a read about um, Kim Kardashian. Um, sh she essentially got um, reprimanded um, in the US for making statements on her Instagram. So just bear in mind, if you are engaging third parties to help you promote the project that you want to ensure as much as you can through your agreements with them, that they will, I guess, not go outside of the, their, your instructions to them as to what they can and can't say. And, and so just to round it out, be really careful when you're promoting the project on, you know, in your roadmap, your white paper on your website or on your, your social media channels, just around the, the messaging that you're putting on there. Next topic is AML CFT. As we've said here, the, the AML, AML CFT legislation will apply to reporting entities. Yeah, so those are businesses that provide a specific type of financial service under the anti-money laundering laws in New Zealand. If, if you are found to be a reporting entity under those laws, there are a number of obligations. Um, and, and some of them include, you, you have to um, have an AML officer uh, appointed within the organisation uh, to ensure compliance with the AML CFT Act. Um, you have to report on certain uh, activities that may have occurred. And you also have to maintain an AML compliance program as well. So there's a, there's a lot going on compliance wise 
we've advised uh, a handful of projects in relation to risk and compliance plans. There's some great guidance from the Department of Internal Affairs for VASPs. I'm sure we can, we may have done a link somewhere, but that is well worth having a read because as I mentioned before, VASPs will be caught by the AML CFT Act as financial institutions. And so when you have a look at the, the VASP guidance, there's different types of VASP which can be caught. And, and one of those which can be caught is an initial coin offering provider. And so a, a, an NFT mint, as you'll appreciate, is, is similar to launching a or doing a coin offering for a, a, a cryptocurrency as opposed to an NFT. So these involve transferring money or value arguably, arguably on behalf of a, a customer or issuing or managing a means of payment and potentially called as money or currency changing. So those are the, those are the things to uh, watch out for with the AML CFT Act. So there's a, a lot of compliance going on. You can outsource or you can't outsource your obligations entirely, but you can engage third parties to assist you with your AML obligations. Parties like Chainalysis and Kroll provide these sort of services to help you identify who you are dealing with. And as sort of mentioned before, the <clears throat> if you're using a whitelisting process, particularly if you're going through a, a third party exchange, then that can assist you with compliance as well. So that's the, the compliance section done. Now we'll look a bit more broadly. So first up, privacy. If in the course of your project, you're collecting personal information, you need to be mindful of your obligations under the New Zealand Privacy Act. So personal information is defined as any information that allows you to identify an individual. And if you're collecting information around that, there are certain requirements that relate to uh, collection, storage, use, and, and disclosure. You'll also need to appoint a, a privacy officer, much like an AML officer. This person ensures that you're complying with uh, the, the obligations under the Privacy Act. Yeah, I guess, um, sorry to sort of jump around a bit, probably should have um, mentioned the FMA guidance on cryptocurrencies is useful to refer to as well when you're considering financial markets conduct, uh, AML and financial services providers. And there's also the, um, the pre-registration service yep. uh, for the FMA. Um, and that's a service where you can uh, consult with the FMA about the project. Um, and as mentioned before, um, you can, uh, I guess, get some uh, guidance uh, as to uh, whether the uh, FMA believes that the, there might be a, a financial product or financial service in terms of your project. Yep. So just jump, coming back to privacy, you, yeah, if you are collecting personal information, you should have a privacy policy or a, a privacy statement. So that's um, a document that's communicating to um, participants how you are complying with the, uh, the Privacy Act. It also sh should inform your participants or investors of a couple of other things. Um, they've got the right to uh, request access and, and change anything that may have been provided by them. And if you are storing personal information overseas, you need to communicate that to your investors and you need to let those investors know that the storage repositories overseas might not have the same privacy laws or they might not follow the same privacy laws that you know we follow in New Zealand. So yeah, investors need to be made aware of that. Next topic, IP ownership and licensing. Yep. Yeah, there are a host of IP issues to consider when you're launching a Web3 project. Key categories of IP are in that first bullet point there. Yes, yeah, it's, it's critical that you know, you, you're running an internal analysis of a couple of things. So you want to work out 
from your perspective, what kind of IP you think you have. And also in the course of the project, what rights you want to be giving out to participants or investors. Yeah, an example is an NFT project James and I worked on where there was you know, an option of either giving ownership rights in the IP to the investor or you know, simply licensing the right to that investor. And so ultimately we, we came to the decision that from the creator's perspective, to the extent possible, it's best to retain all ownership rights and, and effectively just license the right to use the product under that project. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's different approaches. Most of you would have probably noticed that when the owner of the Board 8 Yacht Club purchased uh, the rights to CryptoPunks, they, the Board 8 Yacht Club purchases had very broad commercial rights. So you would have seen the, the purchasers who purchased them were able to do things, for example, you know, where Board 8 uh, clothing and things like that, or have their board ape appear and um, uh, a music video or something like that. Um, whereas the, the the punks holders didn't have the same rights. But when it's Love Labs bought the rights uh, for punks, they granted the punks holders um, more broad intellectual property rights, and that up, uh, ultimately pumped the price of of pump of the punks again because. They just had more value uh, for the holders. I guess another thing to note on intellectual property is around your contracts with with your developers and any other employees involved in the in the project. And you want to be quite clear when you're engaging those parties as to who retains ownership of the intellectual property. If you're not clear about your agreements with the these parties. And we'll, co we'll cover this. There is risk that, I guess, your exclusive ownership of that intellectual property might get challenged. Yeah. So when it comes to structuring for your project, there are a host of options or vehicles at your disposal. Um, the most common ones typically tend to be um, adopting a, a company or a, a limited partnership vehicle. Um, there are also, as that slide shows, other options like charitable trusts or incorporated societies. Quite often it's a, a tax-driven decision that determines the best approach, but it's also about protecting you as far as possible from any claims that might arise. And, and we call it you know, ring-fencing your liability, so putting you in a protective bubble. Yeah, I mean, there's other structures. There's a whole range of different structures that you can one of the sort of key issues in the Ripple Labs case is that Ripple Labs adopted a, a, a different structure uh, to, for example, Ethereum um, and even Solana. Uh, Ripple Labs had the uh, essentially the a, a sort of company structure, I believe it was, whereas Ethereum and Solana both operate via a foundation, mm -hmm. and the foundation is essentially a non-profit. Um, and I guess that uh, can, using a, a non-profit, as I understand it, reduces the risk of the project being viewed as an offer of securities because the, it's the foundation which is essentially trying to grow the, the platform as opposed to grow wealth for the owners of the, the, the currency. Right. Just to that second point on, on the slide, th this is something that we quite often recommend to our clients is to consider adopting a, a holding entity and, a, and an operating entity approach. And, and under that, the holding entity, whether it be a company or a limited partnership or whatever, that holds all the good stuff, all the assets, the cash, the IP, etc. You set up a, a sister company called an operating entity and that's the client facing vehicle that contracts directly with third parties and so if we well, sorry we have a, a license arrangement between the two whereby the holding entity allows the operating entity to use all the good stuff and if if, if the operating entity ever gets into trouble there's nothing sitting behind it so nothing for a disgruntled investor to claim 
Secondly, disgruntled investor can't have any rights as against the holding company because it never had a contractual arrangement in place with it in the first place. So that, that's something you know, to consider when, when you're um, doing a project. There's also, I guess, asset protection in terms of structures that you can adopt uh, to try and, while they may not shield you from criminal liability, they may protect you from, I guess, protect your assets provided they're ring-fenced in, in terms of civil liabilities. I mentioned the use of a family trust to hold an interest, estate planning, having um, a solution in place, you know, particularly if you are uh, controlling uh, wallets and, and other assets. Um, and, you know, there's uh, great projects in New Zealand like Everlasting uh, have a fantastic estate planning service. Um, relationship property agreements, um, you know, you could create an incredibly valuable project overnight. And uh, if um, you're, you are in a, a relationship that's covered by the Property Relationships Act, if things were to turn south with your partner, they may have a claim against you and the, and the project. So again, you know, there's lots of different laws here that can apply Property Relationships Act, Companies Act, Limited Partnerships Act, Limited Partnerships Act. Charitable Trust Act. Charitable Trust Act, <laughs> Trust Act. You know, there's just numerous, numerous things to give consideration to. Yeah, and, and as part of that, you know, we strongly recommend you you get tax advice as well. And, and just to round it off, that, that family trust approach is, is not a bad one because there could potentially be tax benefits for the beneficiaries of that trust. And also from a liability perspective, your personal creditors can't, you know, attack the trust because because of where the assets are located. So yeah, a bit to consider. Tax issues cover this pretty briefly. Get tax advice. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> seek, pretty much. Seek specialist advice, and I mean, increasingly there are. Well, we deal with a number of accountants who have you know good knowledge in this area. They speak with three. Um, I guess it's it's not our like we can form a view on certain things, but ultimately we're not qualified to prepare your your tax returns and things like that. So you'll need specialist advice. And as Andy says, this is also relevant to structuring and I'm trying to find the best, most tax efficient structure for you. And uh, unfortunately, the reality is uh, that uh, sometimes another jurisdiction, such as Singapore or Dubai, or, you know, might even be more appealing to you from a tax perspective. We've sort of touched on this uh, a little bit earlier. It's critical to consider, you know, when you're employing staff, whether you're employing independent contractors uh, or if you're hiring employees, because there, there's a, a legal difference with implications for each. If you're if you're hiring employees, they've got protections under employment law in New Zealand, and, and they at a high level include the right to, um, you know, minimum wage, public holidays, paid leave. Whereas if you're employing an independent contractor, they don't have those those rights that apply to them. So that's one consideration. And then the second one is the, the intellectual property point, which James touched on earlier. Under the Copyright Act in New Zealand, if you're an employee and you're creating copyright or IP in the course of the employer's business, that necessarily, that sheets home to the employer. Whereas with an independent contractor, that IP sits with the contractor. So that's that's quite a significant consideration. And so if you're, if you're bringing on board contractors and you want to hold on to that IP, we strongly recommend that you have an agreement in writing which says something along the lines of any IP created by the independent contractor belongs to the, the project creator. Yeah, another, another point worth noting is, you know, if you're engaging a developer from overseas, it um, pays to have a clause in, in whatever agreement you have, whether that's employment contract or an 
independent contractor agreement, making New Zealand um, the exclusive jurisdiction to determine any disputes. The last thing you want is that contractor having a go at you from a overseas location that just increases cost for you. It's not familiar. You'll have to engage foreign lawyers. You can control the process if you have the right agreements in place. The other thing is, which we've got there, is the confidentiality non-disclosure agreement. Always good practice. If you've got a project, uh, you think you've got a good idea, then um, try and utilize a um, non-disclosure agreement to uh, protect that because ideas themselves are very hard to protect. You can protect the expression of it with copyright or you can protect a name with trademark, you can protect a design with a you know, registered design. But when it's just an idea about what the project looks like, that is a lot harder to protect. The way that you protect that best is through an NDA with appropriate IP provisions. In terms of use, so we help a lot of Web3 clients with their C's and C's. They're really important for setting out the rights and obligations as between um, the parties to a project. They can address a lot of the things that we've talked about today. They also give you a really critical ability to limit and in some cases exclude your liability in relation to that project. There are a host of different platforms where you, you might need T's and C's. For example, for your website, for the specific project itself, for relationships that you might have in place between you and your customers and your suppliers. T's and C's also apply in the context of uh, employment and or independent contracting arrangements, IP licenses, and also at a more corporate level, the relations between you and your founders or, or fellow investors, for example, a limited partnership agreement or a, or a shareholders agreement. And, and, you know, something that we haven't, I don't know if you want to talk to anything else about that, but one thing that we haven't canvassed in the slides, just on this investment component here, in terms of raising capital, you, you're probably aware that there are you know, a number of options to raise money for your project out there. Um, Callahan Innovation, they offer grants and um, uh, an R&D in a technical development context. Um, there are crowdfunding options like Snowball Effect, where they can offer um, either a reward or equity-based um, options. Um, so, but yeah, crowdfunding operators, they have a, a regulated platform in which you can raise funds. But also angel investors, which provide uh, early stage funding as well. For example, um, enterprise angels and, and flying Kiwi angels. So let's probably ask, I, I guess I can add a, a few do's and don'ts. Do be clear about the nature of the NFTs that you're offering. That's going to help us and it's going to help the, um, the regulators understand the project and determine whether or not they're going to be a financial product or a financial service. So do be clear about the way in which the NFTs are being offered to the public. Where are they being offered? Is it just New Zealand or elsewhere? Do be clear about the services that you're providing in relation to the NFTs. Is there a treasury service? Is there not? Is there a burn mechanism? Are you giving you know additional rights in relation to the company or something like that? Do consult with a lawyer to ensure that you're complying with all applicable laws. Don't offer NFTs that are considered to be financial products or financial services without complying with the relevant re regulations. Don't fail to comply with AML CFT Act and don't fail to register as an FSP if you're providing financial services. Um, go have a look at, before you come to a lawyer, have a, a look at the FMA guidance on ICOs and do have a look at the DIA guidance on VASPs. The more prepared you are, the, the smoother it should go and also the sharper we can be with our, our pricing because if we're having to go through a lot of comp back and forth with you to try and work out what how the project works, if we have to go through a whole ton of documents,
then everything just takes time and it becomes more expensive. Yep. So that effectively is, is all from us. Yeah. We've reached the end of our formal presentation. Okay, so we just stop sharing. Nicely done. I actually got a hell of a lot out of that, guys. So, and I know you can think of a number of founders off the top of my head who will be able to move forward on a couple of things just from this presentation. So I've got a few questions, but I'll just read out the questions in the chat first. Sure, sure. Uh, from John Husty, how often are these fines actually happening? Referring to the fines you were talking about, the FMA fines. Well, they, I wouldn't know off the top of my head, to be honest. Uh, you know, it's more common in relation to non-crypto projects. I think it's probably fair to say that most of the, most of the projects that we have looked at have not touched on the, um, we have made compelling arguments as to why they're not financial products. Yeah, okay. the, the regulators are taking an increasingly proactive stance though, like they're removing financial service provider licenses, um, other forms of licenses when uh, the strict requirements of the legislation are not being met. So I think that's probably only going to continue. And you know they're getting guidance from what's taking place overseas as well. So it's a it's a pretty dynamic and, and rapidly evolving area. Yeah, I think I think you can if you were to approach it on the basis that if the FMA learned of your project after the fact rather than by having some consultation with you beforehand, and they formed the view that you were offering financial products and you had operated in breach of the act, I think there is much higher likelihood of a fine than if you had consulted with, with the regulator in the pre-registration process. So being seen to be, you know, you used the phrase taking the regulators on the journey, yeah. you know, there's or actually credence to that. Ask for permission rather than ask for forgiveness. Yeah, so that the regulator is not going to rubber stamp it. And you have to be aware that if you are, if the project changes from the time that you consulted with the regulator, you know, then you could, could create problems for yourself. What you have to remember is, you know, you could have a disgruntled investor who reports you, you know, or you could have a competitor who is not happy with what, whatever you've done, who reports you. So you might think you're flying below the radar, but might you might actually be on the radar okay so from mo he's asking if you're using a third party for kyc and a and l such as some sub do they still need to have a compliance officer or is it an aml officer actually specifically well if again if you're if you think you're going to be caught as a financial institution then the aml cft act is going to apply you're going to have to meet all the all the the tests so the fact that you are outsourcing it is only one element in what you have to do my expectation would be you probably do need to have a um, risk and compliance person and have a plan in place okay if you're a founder is that okay to nominate yourself you can yeah yeah i get okay. you know it's it's one of those things where it, it could be quite a big task. So you have to weigh up the, the benefit versus the hassle on that. Okay. So we've got a couple of comments, interested to get your comments on this. So someone said SEC versus Ripple is trying to draw the line between financial product in brackets, institutional sale and non-security in brackets, usage token, which Judge Tory has ruled in favor of Ripple on programmatic sales and DEX purchases. So limited the Gessler gambit that every token is a security token. Have you got any awareness of that or any comment? Yeah, so I guess the first thing to be aware of is in the US, they don't have these sort of four categories of financial product. We, New Zealand's got financial products for the equity securities, debt securities, managed investment schemes and yeah. derivatives. So these are sort of quite tight categories quite defined you know there is the um, designation power which 
refers to securities, which does encapsulate that how we test potentially. But the main test for the FMA is whether it's going to fall within one of those four defined categories. So if you are limiting your offer to New Zealand, then you, you can really focus on those four categories. If you're making it broader, for example, if you're including an offer to parties in the US, more likely than not, well, the safest practice would be to go and speak to a US lawyer about whether or not what you're doing could be touching on the how we test. So in the Ripple Labs case, I think what you have to remember is the initial coin offering was to institutional investors. And that was, I guess in New Zealand, we call them wholesale investors. There aren't the same requirements as there are when you're offering products to retail investors. The, the offer in Ripple Labs to the institutional investors was caught as a security. So it wasn't the, wasn't the tokens, the, the XRP in and of itself, it's not on its own a security. It was just the way that it was offered, which was the security offering. And they hadn't complied with the requirements there in terms of having the appropriate, what is essentially in New Zealand, our PDS uh, product disclosure statement. Now the programmable sales, which is where what happened was the, the sales by the, by Ripple Labs and the institutional parties to retail was all conducted through uh, exchanges. There was essentially what was called a, a blind bid ask process. So the purchasers didn't know who they were purchasing from and the institutional parties didn't know who they were selling to. And because of that, Judge Torres formed the view that it, that particular programmable sale didn't fall within the in the definition of a offer of securities uh, and investment contract. Okay. Yeah. So I, I guess if you strip it back, there's still the chance that an offer of tokens, if you're offering the tokens to retail straight out the bat, then potentially that could be an offer of securities. Now, as far as I'm aware, there hasn't been any case law on whether NFTs fall within this definition of securities, but you know, there's not too much in terms of difference apart from the fungible, non-fungible aspect of them. Yep. But uh, the, your comment earlier about beware of inadvertently making a retail offer. Can you just talk to that? How can people make sure that they don't do that? Are there simple ways to make sure you don't do that? Retail offer. So an offer to retail as opposed to an offer to wholesale. Yeah. I, I guess you'd have to understand who you're offering yeah. to. Usually if you're going to do a, a wholesale offer, there's a process to go through with that and you will know the party that you are offering to and you typically seek comfort that they are qualify as an institutional wholesale investor. Whereas if you are just doing a... Um, a mint to anyone you're not sure who it is if you just then there's a reasonable chance that it could be a retail offer as andy said you only need one retail person to create a an offer to the public how can you control that possibly through the use of a minting process through the through an exchange that's done kyc so that they know who's involved in um, conjunction with you know specific disclaimers and waivers as well that that canvas that you, that you're you're only offering to certain um, sections of of the community, which is quite often what we see. And a, another potential strategy might be to do a free mint where there's actually no cost for the in terms of the purchase of the asset. Right. Yeah. Obviously, you're not going to raise as much capital, but that you know as part of that process, you know the idea behind our financial markets law is to protect consumers in relation to offers of financial products. So, yep. you know, the, the idea is protect them from spending money and yeah, put themselves at risk if they don't fully understand the risks, you know, that's the part of the idea with the product disclosure statement is that the person who's buying the asset knows exactly what they're getting. And that's why it's so important that the 
product disclosure statement be accurate, not misleading in any way. And uh, yeah, so if you think about your white paper a little bit like a product disclosure statement, then ensuring that it's not misleading in any way, that it's accurate, always sensible to have a lawyer have a look over it, you will hopefully uh, reduce some risk. Yeah, and, and remember, the trigger is always if you're offering a financial product. And so hopefully by that stage, you've engaged lawyers to, to uh, advise you on what you're offering. And, you know, as a secondary step, touch base with the, the Financial Markets Authority to get their take on it. And, and so hopefully by that stage, you would hope more often than not than, that what you are offering is not actually a financial product. And by that, the FMCA staff just falls away. Okay. And, and so, so do you handhold people through that process with engaging with regulators or do you refer them? No, we, we, we've had experience with that, liaising with and, and corresponding with the FMA, in, in particular sort of setting out an analysis of what's being offered under the project and, and we provide our views and there's you know, a bit of back and forth between us and the regulators. No. Okay. So just a couple more questions here. So if doing AML slash KYC, then by definition, you're doing personal data collection. With the multitude of jurisdictions around, this becomes increasing compliance cost for startup. For a startup from a small nation like NZ, this burden is a serious headache. Any comment on that one? I agree. <laughs> yeah, and I guess this is where if you can have some support from an outfit like Callahan. you have supportive in, in investors that will assist in terms of what Blockchain NZ is doing. This, this is a, a big <clears> issue, <throat> and I personally would like to see something in the, in the way of like a regulatory sandbox, which is uh, what they have in overseas jurisdictions where there's essentially like a, almost like a regulator handholding process as well. I'd also like to see some specific law around, in terms of the penalties, penalties not necessarily applying until a project gets to a particular threshold. So, and these are you know, recommendations which have also been made overseas by Blockchain Australia. And yeah, I guess that's a, a wait and see as to what how the law develops. I'm expecting that our our politicians are waiting to see what Australia does. We tend to, rather than be a change maker, we're more in the, the lane of being a fast follower. So yeah, there's definitely a lot going on in Australia. So I, I guess watch this space, but I, I totally appreciate that. Going through all this process with lawyers and accountants and other professional advisors is really expensive uh, and can be cost prohibitive. I guess the the challenge that all of you know many nations have is how do we have how do we encourage innovation without creating bottlenecks like this, which encourage people to go overseas to other jurisdictions where it's a bit easier and and not quite as expensive. Yep, thanks for that. So question from Mark, how long would it take regulators to respond with an answer? They're usually pretty quick. Yeah. Yeah. I guess it depends on the, the nature of the project and whether the project has potential similarities with any, with any of those sort of four key financial products. You know, the sort of, if there are aspects which look like they could fall into that category, there might be a sort of like a question and answer pro project. So, sorry, I can't, that's a bit, a bit vague, but... Um, it also depends on their workload as well, but they're usually um, pretty communicative and, and transparent around that, uh, if you front foot things with them. So. Cool. And so I'm pretty keen to get your thoughts on where we're at in New Zealand currently with uh, the, the challenge with getting bank accounts and, and the emergence of um, alternative intermediaries, to, for want of a better phrase. 
Can mm. I just get your thoughts on, uh, and maybe a snapshot view from your perspective on, on that issue? Uh, yeah, look, it's it's definitely a major issue. Uh, it's something that we've um, talked about um, at Blockchain NZ and was uh, a hot topic at the Digital Assets Conference I went to in Sydney recently, organised by Blockchain APAC. You know, we've had, it, it, yeah, ma major issue, I guess. The, when you look at projects that have done well in New Zealand, like Easy Crypto, Glorious, they are trying to do things in a compliant manner. Some, an outfit like Easy Crypto uses Chainalysis to help it track source of funds and gives it information in terms of any suspicious activity reports that they have to do. When you have that level of support, that, that can give a bank more confidence, right? So there are, I, I think generally the New Zealand banks are, which are Aussie parented, are a bit hesitant in this space. You know, one of the, what well, the chair of Blockchain NZ is Sorel Kai, he's the um, head of FinTech at BNZ, he'd certainly be a good person to talk to. Yeah, I look, it is a, a major issue. We've, I know of at least one of our clients who went through all this process, got compliant, well, registered as a financial service provider, went through the big process of getting a compliant, compliance plan and things like that is subject to so the regulation of the Department of Internal Affairs, but then for whatever reason, wasn't able to get a, a bank account and that effectively shut down the project in New Zealand. Uh, so, you know, really unfortunate, I think for not only for the client, because they'd invested a lot to try and be compliant, mm. they were compliant and then they effectively couldn't do their business but it also robs New Zealand of, of tax revenue, you know, yep. robs New Zealand of jobs. So hopefully uh, I would love to see maybe a more open-minded approach from the, from the New Zealand slash Aussie banks. I mean, if you look, you've got BlackRock, Fidelity, JP Morgan, they're all lining up. These are some of the world's biggest asset managers and banks, BNY Mellon. They're all lining up overseas and... I think what will happen is once there's a bit more clarity in terms of the law, particularly in the US, things are moving in Europe. They've got markets and crypto assets, Mika, which is their specific law in Europe. The UK is looking at, at law. Singapore's got specific law. Hong Kong's making moves. I think as, as you see these changes in clarification of the law, and more institutional parties coming in, there'll be more confidence for the banks, and so hopefully less debanking or non-banking. Mm. Yep. Makes sense. A question just come in: Would it be possible to register a new bank which is more crypto friendly? And I think it's kind of it's that de-risking process for the banks that's really the the fulcrum of progress. And I'm definitely going to look. Is it Chain Analysis you said? Yeah, there's like outfits like Chain Analysis. I know they, uh, well, they're, they're, they're global, but I know that we had, we hosted an event for Blockchain NZ with Chainalysis the other day. And I know that EC Crypto used them because Paul Quickenden was co-presenting with us. So Chainalysis is one. Kroll is another one. They're also, they've got an out, outfit in Australia and... Yeah, so that that you know, you, utilizing these third-party, essentially blockchain forensics companies, can can really assist on the legitimacy source of funds, verification, sort of identifying suspicious wallets and things like that. Okay. There's a question here: Why doesn't the New Zealand government force Kiwi Bank to be more accommodating to New Zealand startups? So it's quite quite a complex issue. I know from my perspective. What I can say is that there's a lot of activity around this to imbue trust into the value chain, you know, between intermediaries. And I'd say, you know, progress is slow, but there is stuff happening. And especially Callahan Innovation, we're trying to accelerate innovation in this space as much as we can. Another comment here, 
what would it take if, say, under UK NZFTA to converge to a common set of market accepted practices with co-regulation that broadly conforms to Commonwealth of Nations to simplify the compliance burden? Great idea. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. yeah just, just quickly to preface that I think a lot of people don't realize that opinion leaders like yourselves do a lot behind the scenes to influence the ecosystem so maybe you could speak to some of the stuff you're advocating as well yeah I think so I was uh, at, at this digital assets conference and there was a whole host of Aussie predominantly lawyers but also regulators discussing the various issues around digital assets. And as you'll appreciate, there's a lot of people who are very new to this space, they're just learning, trying to upskill people on this technology can be a real challenge, particularly if they don't have any specific interest in it themselves. So there's this, everyone's sort of going through an educational process I guess there's differing views on definitions. Is it a digital asset? Is it a crypto asset? Is it, you know, a virtual asset? So you have all these challenges across different jurisdictions, it's sort of similar issues, but across different jurisdictions. So, you know, I, th I think working, having some sort of global framework would be ideal. I guess it's just trying to find agreement on that. You know, that's not to say that it can't happen. We've got cross-border, uh, model law and things on um, which apply in insolvency, for example. So I think it's a watch the space, but it might take a wee while. Yep. And, and so what about finally? Sorry. So I, I was just going to add, David, I think part of all this move by Mr. Gensler and the SEC is in part, and I'm just speculating, in part designed to put pressure on the US lawmakers to try and form a view on what the law is to encourage lawmaking as yep. opposed to lawmaking by enforcement and by the courts. Yeah. So I think there's a recognition that there needs to be law made in the various jurisdictions and you can see them moving towards <coughs> them, uh, but different jurisdictions work at different pace. Yep. And, uh... So, so I think, you know, to, to cap this off, I think if we could finish on, because you've done quite a bit of writing and you, you, you're a strong advocate for the sandbox, perhaps you could talk to how you envisage how a sandbox could be viable in New Zealand. Yeah, well, I think if, if there is a forum where, you know, a party is looking to launch, uh, where they can go and discuss the, the project, get... Um, get guidance from the regulator, get guidance from, you know, perhaps a, a group of professionals, preferred suppliers who understand the topic, um, where does it, the project can be discussed in a, um, a, a, a free manner without sort of worry that um, the regulator is really just um, trying to gather information to, to bring a, an enforcement action or something like that, where the goal is supporting innovation, then, you know, where there's, I guess, clear law, lots of guidance from our regulators as to, you know, we have some guidance from our FMA, we've got some guidance from the IRD, but there's not a huge amount as, I mean, I haven't looked recently, but my recollection is there's actually no specific regulated guidance around in it around non-fungible tokens. So, yeah, I guess that's sort of how I envisage that there's sort of like a, like a one-stop shop that um, someone can go for some guidance. And then if there is a regime where essentially there's different categories of liability, depending on how big the project gets, I think that will encourage innovation. So if you've got a smaller entity that has a, for example, a lower market cap in terms of the amount of capital raised, then lower or no liability. I think you'll, ne you'll never escape a scenario where you have no liability because 
can, consumer protection is uh, a key goal, but um, if there's some sort of lenience in terms of breach, then um, I think that will foster innovation. You know, by the time the projects get bigger, they're uh, better resourced. They can obtain legal advice. You know, they sh they should be compliant. So yeah, and that will inform policymakers and legislators. I Does hope so. Because, well, because I think in an environment like that, the regulator will just be better educated. You know, and then I think it's got to it would have to be an iterative process. And nothing's going to be perfect. And if we're too slow on um, deciding what our law is, um, then I guess you have this scenario like we have now where you'd have so many different acts, a lot of potential risk and liability, a lot of compliance, and um, you know either that reduces the number of projects or it moves the projects overseas. So... We can't just sit on our hands. I think we do need to be a fast follower. Yep, it makes sense. And if, what, one thing I would say is that we have a regular stand-up meeting with the regulators, with the key ones, every fortnight. And when we share our frustrations on behalf of founders, they're very quick to say, well, we regulate to around legislation. So without the legislators on board, mm. there's only so much they can do yeah. as well. Yeah. yeah. So, so I'm I'm interested in your thoughts on how we can engage legislators or, or have access to them as well. Yeah. So a couple of years ago, the Parliament invited submissions on in relation to digital assets. I made a submission on that. I guess we're still waiting for the outcome of that consultation process. So great to see consultation but there hasn't been much movement. I believe that Jeremy Muir from Mint Ellison, Rudd Watts and Alex Sims from the University of Auckland are assisting Parliament in relation to that and they submitted a report a wee while ago, but again, still waiting to hear the outcome. You know, we have our RBNZ recently invited submissions on in relation to digital assets and particularly around central bank digital currencies and things like that. So. There is a consultation process going on and you need a process like that in order to help educate the parliamentarians just to remind them that digital assets, you know, not everything is a an FTX, not everything is just a pump and dump scheme, you know. Okay, yes, the whole space is littered with cowboys and uh, dodgy behaviour, but I think the more that the parliamentarians can be uh, educated, the more that will help move things along. Things like Web3NZ, Blockchain NZ, organisations like Easy Crypto, putting out resource, public resource that assists uh, people in the space is you know, critical. As I'm a big believer in creating content to, to help um, it's, you know, that's why we're doing this webinar. I believe in the asset class, believe in the technology. I think it's superior and it's only a matter of time. And I, I feel obliged to try and help people to navigate this space. So yeah. what what can we do unless there's a, you know, apart from calling up your local politician and seeking a meeting, my view is the best way is to engage in any sort of consultation process and just keep producing content to help educate people. Yeah, that yep, makes a lot of sense. Well, that, that's been a great session, guys. I think we'll wrap it up here. I've put a feedback form link. We appreciate your feedback. We want to make these sessions as uh, useful as possible. And so Andy and James, just interested in your availability for, for, for exploratory discussions with founders. Absolutely. But, how do you suggest they engage. Yeah. Happy to take calls, emails. Happy to take a call. Yeah. Always, you know, I I just love talking about this topic, love learning about what new projects people are doing. So more than happy to take a Zoom or a, have an in-person coffee um, and, and have an initial chat. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. Feel free to contact me, anyone that's listening, watching, and I can put you in touch with these guys as well. Okay.
that's it for now. Appreciate your time. Thanks for attending. Cheers, James and Andy. We'll catch you soon. Thanks, Thanks David. Bye, Thanks, everyone.